know, it's amazing to know that so many people turn out in the city in 1980 to dance to the hits of the uh, 50s and 60s and early 70s, uh, such as we saw at Hondo's that night with Johnny D. You know, the, there was a time when this was the best dance hall in town. Every Saturday, Channel 13 Studios. Yeah, we, we're sitting in a set right now that was occupied by a man who called himself Larry Kane, and he had the Larry Kane Show. A great deal did happen here. And uh, it's very kind. Okay, that's when it goes to the music and the slides. And we'll run it. <clears throat> yeah, just end on this became a dance hall, then I'll. We're going to do it again? Yeah. Okay. Stand by. <clears throat> It's amazing to know that in 1980, so many people turn out in Houston on Friday and Saturday night to dance to the hits of the 50s, 60s, and early 70s. It's uh, quite an experience that night for Johnny D and the Rocket 88s. You know, there was a time throughout the entire decade of the 60s when this, the Channel 13 Studios, was the top dance hall in town That's every what, Saturday. We're sitting here right now in the blank studio that one time was occupied by a man who called himself Larry Kane, and he had the Larry Kane Show. And here today to join us, our very special guest, Larry Kane. Thanks Thank for joining us this week. It's a true pleasure meeting you. Uh, my pleasure. I, ha you. I have heard so much about you and the old days of rock and roll. In fact, Hank and I were talking about it. It was a must to have you on this week. How did it all begin? Heavy on the old. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank Hank right off the bat for being very kind and, and graciously not referring to the fact that you two were both kids watching or hearing about the show at the time it was on. It seems like another life. You were one of the people that we carefully studied as we were molding our careers. That's kind of you. I what, guess, uh, what year did it actually start? 58. Yeah. Right here in these studios. And what led into it? How did you get involved with the Larry Kane show? Actually at that time I was in radio with one of the Houston stations and uh, Mr. Bill Walbridge, who was at that time general manager of Channel 13, decided that it would be a very good idea to perpetuate the popularity of Dick Clark's American Bandstand, which at that time was enjoying such tremendous ratings here in Houston, as well as everywhere else, Monday through Friday. So he uh, decided that a Saturday afternoon show might be a dandy idea. He approached me with it, and uh, I said, sure. Hadn't tried it before. Really didn't think it would be a very long-running situation, but I thought it would be a lot of fun to try. What were your career goals at that time? Career-wise, I had every intention of um, studying law, which I did do, um, but that was my probably one and only goal. In addition to continuing to do radio, I enjoyed radio a lot, and it allowed me the flexibility to study law. You know, all of the music we've all, uh, the music of rock and roll, we've all enjoyed nationwide, but what was Houston like in the late 50s and early 60s? Some of the things you can remember. Well, it was a lot of fun. There was a great deal of, of light-hearted or bubblegum music, if you will, that was uh, enjoying great popularity at that time. As far as the likes and dislikes of the kids, they, they liked to dance. They liked to go out to particular night spots that were very big here in this area at the time. They liked concerts, but uh, the type of music was vastly different from what it later became, particularly in the latter days of our show, the early 70s. I'd have to say it was more light, light-hearted, and um, a lot of fun. The music of the late 50s, early 60s, uh, had several themes to it. There were the teen love ballads, people singing about hurting, about suffering, about lost loves. There was also that rockabilly influence. It was kids rebelling against what? Did you see that uh, rebellion? Did you see a new guard coming in, replacing the old guard? How did the music happen here in Houston? Not so much rebellion in those days. That came later. At the time that we're speaking, I uh, remember the love ballads of B.J. Thomas, for example. I remember the great popularity of Garner State Park out near Uvalde, 
we made that an annual visit for our show. People like Roy Head and BJ and uh, a fellow that I'm sure you remember with a big hit called Blackland Farmer that broke Frankie right here. Frankie Miller. Frankie Miller, right in this area. And we packed them in, literally, from all over the state. They came to see these people. And that went on for a number of years, and we had a film crew there and brought a lot of it back. Well, do, you, do you think Houston, at least when they came to dance, had more of the Fonzarelli type or more of the Richie Cunningham type as far as the, the dress? Richie Cunningham, I'd have to say. My old compadre from the show, Glenn Pitts, is sitting over there, as well as some of the original crew here, like John Cobb, right there. And they might correct me on that and then thinking back say, no, no, we did have some Fonzies running around. But I don't recall too many of those. Do you, Glenn? No, I really don't. Some of us still are the Richie Cunningham characters. Yes. You know, our parents wouldn't let us wear leather jackets and all of that. There was still uh, the older establishment was ruling. When did you notice any of the parents begin getting interested in rock and roll? What was, at that time, kids' music? Yes, as a matter of fact, on Saturday afternoons, the uh, viewing room here was packed. Of course, a lot of the people were here to see their kids dancing and also to impress upon the cameraman and the crew chief that their daughter or their son was that one over there and he should be very careful to be sure that the camera was pointed in his direction from time to time. But a lot of them were here to see the rock acts, whoever they may be. They um, were on hand with the autograph books way back in the early 60s to meet people. Uh, I recall we had a, a taping session with Bobby Sherman. We had uh, more parents here with the autograph books and with the great interest in meeting him personally than we did kids. Did you ever get a chance to talk to the kids off camera about their main concerns at that time period? What were kids really worried about or thinking about in those days? The traditional boyfriend-girlfriend problems. Um, who's breaking up and who's now going to start going with whom. They were a lot more interested in that time uh, period in the various acts coming to town and appearing at the Taylor Halls, the Teen Halls, the Catacombs. These were the clubs that were so prevalent in the Houston area at that time. And uh, this was most of the conversation that I had. They were always asking me who was coming next and why couldn't we get so-and-so in this area. Did any of the kids ever come to you with specific problems and say, Larry, what should I do? Yeah, they did. They did. Uh, the traditional problems of the parents not understanding them and not letting them, for example, go to Garner State Park and spend the entire week only coming up for a weekend. What can I do? Will you talk to my mom or my dad? Um, I have to say that aside from the, the, the casual conversations in the halls and in here in the studio, we really never had much of an opportunity to visit at length because uh, the herd came in and the herd went out. We had a huge group of people in here. And um, sometimes we'd be on the air longer than anticipated because the game ran short. So our show had to fill. And uh, people were in a hurry to leave and they were in a hurry to clear the studio. So we didn't really get an opportunity to visit at length. Your kids were very experienced. They were, in effect, trained dancers. Most of them were. And by that, I don't mean to imply that they had to be trained for specific routines on the show, but we did have a pretty careful screening process at that time to be sure that the kids had some dance ability. What was the best experience with a national rock group, and what was the worst experience with a national rock group, since it was a live show? Very difficult, Don covers a lot of years, but I guess I'd have to single out the Paul Revere and the Raiders taping, which began at 12 midnight after a concert they had done at the catacombs here and went most of the night. And they took advantage of every prop in this studio, and then some. They went into the prop room and improvised, and they were very clever guys, if you recall. So they used everything that was available. And we did probably six or eight songs with them, plus a bunch of interviewing. Cut it up into three or four different shows. An unforgettable night, in every sense of the word. Uh, as far as the other side of the coin, many of those situations. We, uh, we had, particularly in the early 70s, when we got out of the light music and into the very heavy, we did have some people who showed up ill-prepared to be on camera. 
uh, as a matter of fact, totally wrecked, and uh, we had to do the best we could to glean any kind of an interview out of them. But one particular instance involved um, one of the better known groups, uh, Santana, which involved a trumpet solo somewhere in the middle of the song, which Mr. Santana either forgot or elected not to fool with. He left the platform and started meandering through the crowd. And our very clever director at the time had to improvise and did so. Um, I do want to point out this early, early on. And they've already done the lighting, and they can't help me very much now at this stage. But we had the greatest crew, as far as I'm concerned, that a, a TV show could have, and uh, a series of fine directors who showcased these people the way they like to be showcased. And they couldn't believe it, because only on high-budget network shows did they get this kind of showcasing. But when they came to Houston, they knew they were going to be made to look good. And this also involved the guys who were not prepared to come here and tape. They even made them look good. Well, the Larry King Show looks so good that it tr made the transition from local station here on Channel 13 to nationally. How many stations were you syndicated on? We were in uh, about 110 or 112 at our peak. And, um, of course, we had a number of problems in syndication that you don't experience locally. I won't bore you with uh, a list of these, but a few that are obvious. You're not as well known in the other markets as you are in your hometown. Therefore, when you're scooted around all over the schedule at the whim of the baseball or football game, uh, people don't tend to follow you as much as they will look for you in the hometown where you're established. So when we were on at 12 noon one week in a particular city, and the next week we were on at 3, and the next week maybe 4.30, this played havoc with some of our rating numbers. Didn't even bandstand see a little lull in the action there in the late 70s and the Absolutely. mid 70s? Well, Dick ran into some problems with uh, the gigantic Senate payola probes and this took its toll with him, although he was vindicated. Uh, it did play some havoc with his numbers. And also, I think, in part, uh, as he mentioned at the time, uh, just overexposure five days a week, uh, after a long enough period of time, it tended to, to wear thin in some areas. you like being compared to Dick Clark? Uh, it was inevitable, and it's, of course, it's always unfortunate because he was the first and uh, the daddy rabbit of all, and uh, still is. Uh, he uh, has had a phenomenal career has branched out and into production of so many properties. And uh, I, I never felt we were comparable, any more so than the fact that we tended to do interviews a great deal alike. We like to listen to people. We like to uh, ferret out information from people. And he and I always got along extremely well. What about Alan Freed? Only met Alan on two occasions and didn't really know him well, but um, studied him. In my younger years, he was the man to study. A couple of questions. First of all, sometimes people in this type of business, whether it be radio or in a dance program such as one you had, some people wonder if you really, in fact, liked the music you were playing. What type of music did you like personally, and what type didn't you like? I really liked everything that we played, not on a per-record basis, but I would say 98% of the music that I played, the groups that I had, I liked through all of the years until the latter days, the early 70s, the times when we got more away from the ballads and from um, the um, bubblegum and the lighter music and started getting terribly, terribly heavy. And by that, I don't mean musicianship, because I always appreciated that, and we had some tremendously talented musical groups on who improvised in their music. But when we had people who came on the show to campaign for a particular cause and um, wanted to get heavy politically um, and we would show up in a bad condition for taping or for a live show, I didn't like this. And uh, the latter couple of years, I really didn't identify so much with most of uh, this music. Rock and Roll is here to stay. Danny and the Juniors sang that in their song. Rock and Roll proved itself to be more than a music form. 
And of course, it was also a very successful business for him. It was probably the most major cultural influence of this century. Uh, could you see it happening gradually, or did it happen all at once? Gradually. Gradually. Along those lines, how did, the, how did Houston's audience take to the Beatle era when they hit? In what respect? I mean, we for the longest time we're playing rock and roll and it was the Elvis image and some of the earlier songs and then suddenly from England comes the group with the haircuts. How did Houston uh, uh, analyze that whole situation? Did they catch on fire with the, the same uh, national... Uh... As I recall, Houston was a little bit slower to grab it than um, other parts of the country. But once they grabbed on, it uh, went like wildfire. We had one or two disc jockeys locally uh, here who uh, had gone to London and taped some interviews with them. I think Buddy McGregor mm -hmm. uh, from KNUZ at the time, and gave him a great deal of exposure nightly on the radio. Uh, I gave him a great deal of exposure through some mutual friends, uh, telephone interviews, tapes, and, and limited video. And uh, Houston uh, pretty well followed the rest of the world but they were a little slower at the, at the outset. The straw was broken on the American Bandstand show, the Chalips, a lot of other dances. Were there particular dances that were popularized on the Larry Kane show here in Houston? Some of the Garner State Park, uh, it's uh, quite amusing and interesting now to see the, the great popularity, thanks to Urban Cowboy and Gillies, of uh, the Cotton Eye Joe and um, the dances that you see at Gillies. We were doing those at the time, thanks again to Garner State, and they were uniquely ours down here. Again, we concentrated in large part on some of the traditional dances, like, uh, if you will, the cha-cha and the whip and plain old uh, foxtrot dancing that, uh, for some reason, seemed to freak people out that kids were doing these. And even when we went to Philadelphia to uh, fill in for Dick on two or three occasions during the summer on bandstand, some of our kids went along. And I had no idea how they uh, would be uh, responded to in Philadelphia going in with these kind of dances. And by and large, it was really well received uh, because it was different to them. And of course, we did the stroll and we did everything here that bandstand popularized. Did parents ever question the the types of dances as to whether or not they were obscene as far as oh, being yes. seen on television? Yes, and and groups as well. Again, the camera shots had to be terribly clever at times because we had certain individual members of groups who uh, uh, out Elvis to Elvis. <laughs> Did Larry Kane himself change through the years? There were a lot of people. Uh, each of us did a similar show in, a, in different markets. There were those who, when the hair got longer, they grew the hair longer. They wore Nehru jackets. They, uh, uh, yet Dick Clark remained the same. Mm -hmm. uh, how did Larry Kane fare during all of those years? Was, was he different? I had to try my hand at each for a very brief, fleeting time. Uh, mainly in fashions more than in anything else because the hairstyles um, grew it a little longer. Never long, but a little longer. But I did wear the Nehru jackets. Uh, I, I think even on one occasion when Joe Tex was here, or Lou Rawls, I think I even had on a sequin jacket, which um, my kids could not believe I was doing, and I couldn't either. And in watching the tape playback, uh, I didn't do it anymore. But it got some rather favorable comment from a few people, simply because they didn't think I would do it. Did you review yourself as one of the kids or more of a big brother figure? I would have to be uh, the latter, if anything. One of the kids, uh, no. Appreciating a great many of the same things, yes. When did you finally end, and how did it end? Well, after syndication, we began to, um, and uh, the tapering off of our rating situation, as I say, we did well. We, we reached high penetration, and we got some decent numbers and sponsorship and, and did pretty well. And then the show started to um, fade, and we started losing markets. And we really didn't have, at that time, the interest or the type of staff vehicle to try to perpetuate it. 
and it just gradually phased out. We, uh, in the meantime, my law practice from an entertainment standpoint had grown, and I was finding myself in a rather untenable situation because I was talking to record companies about artists to appear on my show, and these may be the very same companies that I'd be calling a day or two later to threaten with a lawsuit on behalf of a client who was upset because they hadn't collected their royalties. So I think the handwriting was on the wall, and it just gradually phased out. And uh, no regrets, a lot of fun along the way. Could it happen again? Could live TV ever do anything like a, a bandstand, a Larry Kane show? Gee, I'd like to think so. I really would, because first of all, everything seems to be so cyclical, and uh, it comes around again. We were talking earlier about the contest, the big contest of the, of the 60s uh, or 50s, and how, how big some of the very same ones are again. And that's inevitable with just about everything. So I think that kind of show could work. And live TV is so much fun. Do your children now, they're at the age now where they would have, had they been around then, would have come to the studio to dance. Did they ever ask you about those days? And they about did. About dad being a, the host of a dance party? They did. They did. My two daughters danced on the show. We had uh, the um, ever-present risers in the background. And two of my daughters were on the risers with the go-go boots and dancing. And the Christmas show, we had uh, the entire crew had their kids here, and, and I had mine. And um, yes, it's come up on many occasions. And of course, the free circus tickets and all of the nice fringes that went with that kind of life, your kids tend to remember and ask you, why aren't you doing that anymore? Haven't heard those questions in a while. Your life is a lot different now. It's quite it's a bit. All long. Quite a bit. It's a... Uh... Could you do it again? I really don't know. I, I, that's not a cop-out. I really don't know. I, I, what was happening in the early 70s with the heavier groups and the heavier themes and the deep hidden meanings to everything and the tremendous drug cult, I could not do again, could not identify with. What was happening in the early days of the show, that to me was just a lot of fun musically in every other way. Yes, I probably could. I don't know, we, we didn't get a chance to cover this, but when you talked about beginning in 1958, for many of us in our 30s, that was just starting to really get into it as, you know, younger brothers and younger sisters around 11 and 12. Can you remember the first national group, or at least one or two of the first national groups you actually got to come into this studio when the show was in its infancy stage? We had Chad and Jeremy who um, Hank will have to help me out with some of their... 64, Summer Song. It was a Summer yeah. Song. Summer Song. They uh, were very big at the time, and uh, an English group, and we did not think we would fare too well in trying to get them on the show. We weren't even in this building. We were still in our original Channel 13 studios over on Cullen, and they came, stayed a long time, taped, interviewed, very impressed with everything. What about Jerry Lee Lewis or Chuck Berry, Bo Diddley, some of the earlier pioneers? Had all of them on the show. And yes, I at the time could not believe we had them. We had to uh, pull some strings and make some calls and lean on some friendships. But we told them at the time, if you come and you do the show and you see what this crew can do with you, we think you'll be pleased. And they did, and they came, they saw, they liked, and they wanted to come back. What were your recollections of the King, Elvis Presley? Only a couple of brief meetings. One very brief session out at the Astrodome Hotel, and the type of situation where everyone was herded in and herded out by the very busy colonel with the long cane, telling the RCA people and telling everyone, Elvis is tired, let's move this along. What about Buddy Holly? Buddy Holly, we uh, only met on one occasion, had him on the show, and it, as I recall, went very well. Nothing uh, outstanding about it except a very enjoyable interview. I had uh, the Big Bopper and also uh, Richie Valens all around the time, very shortly before this plane crash. 
In fact, there were two incidences, and with the movie Coal Miner's Daughter now so popular, it brought to mind the fact that we had had Patsy Cline and Jim Reeves on the show about three days before that plane crash, maybe two days. And those, those two inc incidences happening uh, tend to make an indelible impression on you. The Caravan of Stars, was this a stop for the, when they were around? The, the bus loads from Detroit, Motown, that era? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Particularly, not in the early days. Houston, again, was something of a latecomer for those type of packages. But Houston came into its own and was definitely included on every itinerary. Larry, I want to thank you for joining us today. I, we could talk for hours on this subject, and it's just been a delight having you. And a lot of people watching will uh, reflect back on those times. And one, one, one final question. Having okay. been on that many years, did some of the, the kids from the very first year ever come back married or later on in life with, uh, to visit? All the time. All the time. And it has been a real joy to watch some of these people grow up and still maintain our contacts one way or another. Of course, you lose so many contacts. One of my pet topics of conversation is our mutual good friend Jimmy Carolla. Jim Carolla, pardon me, who started as Jimmy Carolla on our show at age 16 and went on to develop a nice deep resonant voice and become a very well-known figure here in the Houston market on KILT. And Jimmy and I have maintained our friendship through the years. And of course, often discuss the fact how, as the years progress, the age differential between the two of you doesn't seem to have the impact that it used to. Because when he was 16, I was 21. And now, well, we don't have time for that. <laughs> well, I've been an admirer of years for years, and I know a lot of us that uh, came along in radio throughout the 50s and 60s had uh, people like Larry Kane, Dick Clark, many other people from for whom we patterned our careers. Well, thank you, Hank. Uh, it makes me feel very good. As a matter of fact, this entire thing makes me feel very good to come back and have the the, the joy, and it really is that, and seeing everybody again and being back here where it got started in 58. So thank you for asking me and including me in this nostalgia. Thanks for being here. You want to do a close? Hmm? We're going to use it for that... Uh... For, it. for the for the Wednesday show, are we going to use the Honda's clothes? Yeah, we can double back on that, or we yeah. can just end it with a, a trailer here with Larry Kane continued tomorrow. Because I want to carry Larry over. Yeah. Yeah. So we may for the Thursday yeah. show, we need to do uh, a, pro, a, a close. You know, join us tomorrow when it, when the, when the No, we're going to do a live close because okay. yeah. Thank you. that's a loaded statement. <laughs> Needs more gray hair. Yeah, that's that's quick. We are going to do that, but what I'm going to do is we're going to come back live and do some Larry upstairs. Yeah, sure. Rather than do a Charlie because there's going to be so many edit pieces of music and there'll probably be a trailer on as they come to live and then we'll say we're going to pick up our conversation with Larry Kane tomorrow. Yeah. I was thinking about for the Thursday yeah. show to well, say come back tomorrow, mm -hmm. you know, to read in for the show. Okay, good. All right. Okay, just for cover on one. Okay, and I'll look this way. We're doing mainly entertainment and oil and gas. Okay. All right, I'll just say something. Larry, there's so much to talk about back in the days when there was the Larry Kane show and uh, we we'll want to invite everyone to join us tomorrow. We'll once again talk with Larry Kane. Okay, that'll be a that'll be a bump. And then um, yeah, I'll do it. Only shot uh -huh. one and talk about ten share on Saturday night. It's unheard of. I want to play nice. Chuck and Bo in in um, Monkey Fight and all this other stuff. I have. Oh. You ever hear of a jock named Porky Chadwick? No. This guy was, Where was he? he was in Pittsburgh, and he was on an all-black station. He was the only white guy. He was uglier than homemade soap. <laughs> but he had the best following. You know what he did? He used to play the obscure records, you know, and he gave a lot of young groups a break. And, you know, like Porky's List.
Larry, we want to talk some more with you about the old days. Uh, I should say the days of the 60s into the early 70s of the Larry Kane Show. And we're going to do that tomorrow on the series that we're having all this week. So we hope you'll join do us. Do that again, please. What? Mm. Well, I thought you were going tight on one.